the 60s, I'd say. Well, that's not it's, too bad. It's not a cold 60s. Like, in Phoenix, that would be freezing. Yeah, I know. It was, like, fit to getting into, like, almost, well, just below 60 in, uh, at night, and that's, like, pretty chilly. Yeah, I was out this morning, and it was, like, 42, and I saw this is going to be cold. Mm. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, in Phoenix, it's chilly when you can go outside, when you go outside in your shorts and t-shirt, and you're like, I feel weather. What's going on here? Yeah, that's right. As you know, you've lived here a long time. You're a native. Mostly. All right. So uh, I guess I should tell people who our guest is today. It is. Yes. We're, we're a little late because there was just a lot going on. I actually wasn't feeling good, too, yesterday morning. But uh, we are preparing to go out to the Travis Walton um extravaganza for the rest of the week too so and i'm uh, so bummed i'm not going to be joining you guys yeah well if some lazy aliens come and, and zap us you'll be better off i will be here to tell your story yeah exactly so uh so we've been busy so we're a little late with the show uh lee of course is always busy as well and that's who our guest is lee spiegel of course we have him on every so often and i was thinking about it we'll probably have him on sometime in january too because we always like to do our year in review uh unfortunately lee lee is a night owl and he wasn't able to do the show until late in the evening last night um, so you, Jason, were not able to join us as usual, um, but, you know, when we do the year in a view, review in a few months, of course, we'll make sure all three of us are there again. But, yeah, uh, we'll make it happen. It is it is tough to get on with Lee because of his nightness and uh, being on the East Coast and all, so it, it yeah. complicates things, especially for myself, who wants up in bed around 8. Yeah, you're a very, very early bird. Um, luckily I'm a bit of a night owl too, but, uh, but yeah, we talk about his latest couple of stories for the most part. You know, I, I knew, you know, we get to talking and we could talk forever. So we talked about his Nazi story and, uh, that we also wrote. And then this, uh, moon UFO story that he wrote and the controversy that has cropped up on both stories. So very interesting and fun stuff. But before we get to that interview, Jason, why don't you and I talk about some UFOs in the news? That's a fantastic idea. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good one. So uh, why don't we start with you, Mr. McClellan, and why don't you tell us about one of your favorite stories from the last week? Well, I don't know about you, Alejandro, but I am still pretty fascinated by whatever – has been seen and continues to be seen in the skies over Colorado. I mean, hmm. this has been going on for months now, uh, where these bright lights have been seen in the daytime sky. And uh, just uh, last week, we had another story about it. Um, and from Judy from the UFO Watchtower, um, describing these to the NBC affiliate there, describing these things as strange, round, white lights. And she says they've been seen since September 13th, and no one can figure out what these things are. Now, some of the photos and videos posted of these things, um, especially one in particular, this kind of teardrop shape uh, points down to the bottom, looks very, very much like a hot air balloon when it's uh, igniting its flame. But, you know, again, Alejandro, this goes back to uh, the story um, we talked about at the beginning of October, and this was the – Similar objects, these bright white objects that initially had been reported that uh, NORAD and the local police were investigating these things. In that particular instance, a newscaster for one of the local stations observed the objects with his own eyes and saw these things hover in place for a long time and then shoot off out of sight. And that's also what Judy described uh, these things doing as well, saying that they will appear in the sky – and hang around, and then shoot off, and then come back, and do these crazy maneuvers. Now, they some tried to write these off as possible um, Google loon balloons, but, you know, again, we pointed out the last time we talked about this, and I don't know about uh, the secret balloons that people have going on, but as far as I know, Alejandro, balloons don't shoot off. It's kind of incredible. Yeah. So I don't know what to make of these strange things over Colorado, and apparently other people don't either. 
Yeah, yeah. Funny enough, my first sighting was with Judy at the UFO Watchtower. Um, That's right. Yeah, and it was a bright point of light uh, there in the San Luis Valley. I witnessed and investigated a lot of these lights in Colorado, and they did mostly turn out to be balloons, but not all of them. And I witnessed myself ones that, you know, had uh, did things that balloons don't do, like stay in place for, for a long, 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 long time. And then one of them stayed in place for a long time and then uh, faded out and then it reappeared in a different place, not very far. And it stayed there until it disappeared. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what's going on in Colorado. It's it's really weird. And, and yeah, they've seen a, a lot more of this stuff going on lately. It's kind of cool. Hopefully people keep getting footage. Yeah, and perhaps we should take a trip out to the Watchtower ourselves. Yeah, we really should. It'd be fun to film. Uh, Judy's a great lady. Um, I used to host her yearly events there. Before I emceed for the Congress, I emceed for the UFO Watchtower. Uh, she has a little event, and she is such a cool lady so it's fun to promote her and she's gotten a lot of uh, publicity but uh, the San Luis Valley of course is really mysterious we'll have Chris O'Brien who uh, lived out there and is sort of an expert well is the expert for the mysterious valley at the Congress this year yeah that's right yeah so pretty cool pretty cool and then along with Colorado which you know MUFON just put out the report uh, for the month of uh October and the sightings and they have some rated in alert one which means they're having a lot of sightings per capita in uh, West Virginia Maine Delaware and Colorado but uh, we're you know writing a lot of stories on West Virginian sightings too Roger Marsh is posting so West Virginia and Colorado are getting a lot of attention for UFO sightings those have been the Big newsmakers, yeah, lots of sightings going on in those places. Yeah, recently uh, triangular formations uh, being seen out there, just a lot of uh, of sightings and a couple photographs, uh, stuff like that. Cool stuff. So what's your story, Alejandro? This guy is a politician in Sri Lanka, and he says that uh, some – White gentleman, and actually it's an Indi- it's a phrase in Indian for white gentleman, I guess, that they have that he used, uh, tried to steal meteor fragments that prove aliens exist. And he says the reason they tried to do this is to hide from the world that creationism is a blatant lie. Uh, what he's talking about, we've written before. Uh, earlier this year, there was a paper that came out from the Journal of Cosmology written by uh, Chandra Wickram. Can you, you could probably say it better. You say his name often. Wickramasinghe? <laughs> Chandra Wickramasinghe. Wickramasinghe. There you go. See, you get it right. I totally messed it up on spacing out uh, so when people see that Friday. But, uh, yeah, he's the director of Buckingham Center for Astrobiology. And they found some meteor fragments, which they examined, and Chandra wrote this story or wrote a paper along with other scientists about how they believe there's evidence of extraterrestrial life in these meteor fragments. That did make some news. There are other meteor fragments they have seen that they believe uh, also have extraterrestrial life in them and that these are meteorites from, from space and from elsewhere. And they believe they've gotten a dragon particle, and this made news just a few weeks ago, A particles from the stratosphere that have extraterrestrial life. So it's not like it was really hidden. So if these white gentlemen tried to hide this information, they, they were not successful. But, uh, yeah, this guy seems to have this thing against creationists and, uh, you know, feeling like there's some grand conspiracy. And I guess they had infiltrated this international space agency, according to him, and tried to steal this stuff. Um, I don't know. I have not read his story, and I don't know that there's ev- any evidence that this has actually happened. He doesn't name who this space agency is. But uh, it would be interesting if he could share some more information on who these people were that tried to steal their E.T. uh, meteorites. Well, and it seems kind of silly to me. I mean, I don't understand how he could, uh, you know, what his his stance is and how that uh, evidence could disprove creationism. 
because there are plenty of people, and I might group myself into that pile, of people who think that uh, you know extra, extraterrestrial life, intelligent extraterrestrials, and creationism work just fine together. You know, who's to say that extraterrestrials didn't create us? You know, so extraterrestrial life isn't exclusive of creationism. Yeah, That's it all seems I'm more like dinosaurs or Neanderthals or something like that would be more evidence against creationism than extraterrestrial life. Right. Um, the church is talking about, you know, integrating these things and these ideas. So I agree with you. It doesn't really challenge creationism. He kept talking about how uh, the evidence of extraterrestrial life supports Buddhist teachings. And I really think that this was kind of some grandstanding, some political grandstanding at this Buddhist temple, kind of saying we're right and, you know, science is proving us right and the creationists are wrong and they're trying to thwart our efforts. I think it was kind of him grandstanding and getting kind of this fervor going to to support uh, his his political position in Sri Lanka rather than dealing with facts. And unfortunately, as we know, in the midst of these current political campaigns, facts uh, kind of are secondary to, uh, to these concepts and ideas that can uh, just rally support around your, your, what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think he did, you know, and who knows if, any of the claims are actually true, but I think he did more more harm uh, to his cause than good by coming out and accusing people of doing things for the reasons he stated. But I guess we should say it's entirely possible right. that uh, some shenanigans did go on. Yep, that's right. Who knows? Uh, hopefully we'll hear more about that if that's true. But with these... That story and related stories, like you pointed out, I mean that these team of researchers, uh, the people who assert having evidence of extraterrestrial life, that evidence is just mounting. And, uh, you know, we're hearing more and more stories about it every year. So I, I think I think pretty soon that mountain's going to be pretty big, Alejandro. Yeah. Yep. There's just one last story I wanted to talk to you about. All right. And this was on Halloween's Eve. And just to get your take on it, because I think it's interesting uh, in its implications either way. But this is this young couple in uh, Canada, the town of St. John in New Brunswick, Canada, who filmed this light in the sky. And it, I, I can see how they were interested. It's this interesting light that is at a fair distance, maybe a mile or so away, it appears at first. They think it's over this industrial area. And then it moves towards them, and they start to freak out. They said they were terrified, and it takes a position not too far out of their apartment window and sits there, and you can hear them talking, and they're laughing, but nervously, and they're, they're talking about how they're freaked out, and, and they're like, this is watching us, it's watching us, I, you know, you realize this is a UFO, yes, it's a UFO, and so they watch it for a while, and then it, it drops down behind the... the Buildings, they, they said they got in their car to go find out what it was, which is pretty cool because uh, if it is a drone, you know, sometimes often you'd probably see people standing in the field flying it around. But uh, they never did find out who it was, and they believe it to be a UFO. Uh, many others, including the news reports, said they think it's a drone. In fact, Canada, coincidentally, the day after, passed some laws uh, about drain flying drones and, and uh, well, really some guidelines about not to do it at night and stuff like this. Um, but uh, a lot of people, of course, are saying, well, that's a drone, that's a drone. And uh, it probably is, but uh, I think that the reaction that the people had was really interesting, terrified. And uh, it's just this interesting, I think, cultural and maybe even uh, psychological aspect of UFOs, kind of uh, the, uh, the concept of UFOs even making people terrified when they see lights that they can't explain in the sky. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I will say that I I agree. I think I don't see anything in the video that would indicate this is anything other than something like a remote-controlled quadcopter. Um, but to your point about the, the reaction, the behavior of people seeing unknown objects in the sky, it's, it is always fascinating to see just how everybody is different and everybody – you know, has a different view on something like uh, objects in the sky they can't identify. 
and uh, we've seen this and heard in, in people telling their stories of you know, alleged contact and things like that. People deal with situations in different ways. Some use humor. They laugh at it um, to kind of downplay the actual fear they have inside and, and what they're truly feeling. Um, but there are a lot of people, and we hear in several of these UFO sighting cases that we talk about, people being terrified because there's an unknown in the sky. They have no idea. They they don't recognize it. They don't know what the intentions are of this thing, what it will do. So I can understand the uh, the sense of, of fear or, or, you know, just just the problem of, of not knowing uh, um, something that's there. And especially if you feel it's coming towards you or watching you for whatever reason that feeling came. Um, I could see how that would be terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. They really got freaked out. I mean, they talk about it. And I think that they're if it is a drone, they seem um, not ex- upset about that suggestion, but they feel like they even said, it's an invasion of privacy. So if it is a drone, they feel a, a bit violated, um, or at least that they were kind of the victims of, of a scary prank or something. But uh, and rightfully so. I mean, it's it's the uh, the modern modern tool of, of peeping toms. Yeah. And how are we going to do this? And yeah, people may be doing that, flying them around to look at people in their homes. And you know, it's not illegal to videotape. Anything that can be seen from public uh, lands, at least in the U.S. So that's how paparazzi get pictures of, of celebrities. As long as you're in a public space, you can take pictures. So it's just the laws around this are interesting. And more and more in the future, I think that we're just going to have to deal with stuff lying around all over the place that not only we will see and looks weird and we don't know what the heck it is, but uh, that will also be looking at us. And it's kind of has sad, scary implications for the UFO field because pretty soon we're not going to care about strange lights in the sky because it's like it's probably just a drone. It's probably just something flying around. What do I care? Um, yeah, I don't you're right. Know that I mean, the products that we're, we're seeing in the sky are just growing and growing at an incredible rate. You know, mm. we're, we're very close to flying cars. Um, you know, we have all sorts of interesting balloons out there now um, for research and for Internet and all these other things. The Google Loon Balloons is a great example. Um, police are using really bizarre kind of uh, balloons and, and different varieties of, of these drones and quadcopters and things for surveillance. I mean, there's just an, an incredible array of, of things out there, and it just keeps growing. So I think you're sadly right. Um I do think that people are just going to kind of get used to shrugging their shoulders and going, eh, probably a drone. Yeah. And we're, we're already seeing that. So Big deal. Yeah. So I guess finally, because I just realized we didn't say this on the other show, uh, we're going to have Bob Lazar at the Congress. Yes, we are. How exciting is that? That's pretty exciting. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to it. I know you and I have been biting our – our fingernails over this thing because you know we've been working on arranging this for a while and been waiting to hear back a final confirmation and you know more and more we're sending each other messages like have you have we gotten it have we gotten it oh my gosh when is this going to come so we've been really excited and finally we can announce it and it's 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 finalized that we're going to have bob lazar so this is really exciting the only other time he's spoken uh, to the public is in 1993, a small gathering in the desert. So really, this is his first public appearance. Yeah, it, it that's what makes it so exciting. And, you know, regardless of, of your personal take on the Bob Lazar story, Area 51, the whole package, this is a pretty uh, – it is a unique opportunity, you mm-hmm. know, and, and who knows if it's going to happen again. So we are really excited to have been able to execute – this and i am really looking forward yep it ought to be good stuff all right thanks jason my pleasure buddy let's talk to mr lee spiegel i am happy to welcome back to the show sir leland spiegelheimer (laughs) yeah now can you spell that for all of us (laughs) <laughs> At least I think that's what it says here in the German version of your story here. On I don't I don't know why 
Huffington Post does this. It's like I occasionally I'll I'll go through my story archive and I'll see a German version, I'll see a Japanese version, I'll see one in France and and it's like wait a minute, what what are they doing to me? And <laughs> and and I then I'll scroll down just to make sure that the English version is also still there. <laughs> yeah. It's so strange. So, of course, for those who don't know, and I'm sure everybody does know because I have you on periodically, it's actually Mr. Lee Spiegel of the Huffington Post. So, yes, your latest story uh, is is about German stuff, but uh, that is funny because, you know, when you go look at your archives, the very first one that comes up is all in German about (laughs) Flugobecks. I know. Wering clicked Flugobeck. Well, you know, I I, and since you know that I steal most of my stories from you anyway. Um, you, you're, you're, the, you're my main source. And so you're, it's, it's you, you're, you're at fault. If it's a German, if it's been translated into the German, then I'm sure you've, you made sure that somebody did that just to make me look bad. <laughs> well, this is funny. And that's why this conversation is going to be fun because you wrote uh, about, you know, uh, this, this story, which we're going to talk about, about, you know, that's, possible secret Nazi aircraft uh, crashing and being responsible for Roswell. So we'll talk about this. And you referenced the story that I wrote. And now more media is picking it up because the Huffington Post wrote about it. And they're also referencing me, which is scary because (laughs) I was taking the word from Daily Mail. And some of this information is a little dubious, as most information from the Daily or much information from the Daily Mail is. So um, so this is kind of funny. Uh, Anyway, why don't you give us the the gist of the story? Well, the gist of it, as as we both kind of learned at the same time, that now they're saying, here's a new theory. It's not really a new theory. It's the latest of what really happened Outside of Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947, uh, you, you know there there have been so many explanations of whatever it was that came crashing out of the sky. Everything from an extraterrestrial spacecraft to weather balloons to uh, a military spying device uh, to check out to see how the Soviet uh, Union was doing with the nuclear testing. Everything's been offered to explain this, and along the way there have been other theories. Uh, and this is, this is one of them. This is not the, the first time that this theory has come up. But but now, uh, apparently, a, according to the mirror, where you and I both had, had used that as a source, the mirror is claiming that there's a new documentary, a new German documentary um, that uh, is called supposedly UFOs and the Third Reich. And it's promoting the theory that Nazi Germany created a 10 foot wide, 12 foot high, anti gravity bell shaped craft, bell shaped craft that combined supposedly. I will always use words like supposedly, reportedly, allegedly, which until, is great until I'm blue in the face. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this thing supposedly combined rocket and helicopter technology, and that at some point, it fell into the hands of America in 1943, who, according to the story, the American military d- worked on the project even more. And then four years later, 1947, during a test of this alleged bell, it crashed somewhere near Roswell. And hence the theory that this began the Roswell crash story. Well, you know, it's like my my head explodes <laughs> o- over stuff like this, and and it's it's fodder for the kind of emails that I get from oh, people. Oh yeah, and and you know, you you and I have talked about this before, and <clears throat> both you, my my editors, the people I work for at Huffington Post, they're always saying to me, "Don't read the comments." Mm-hmm. Don't don't do it because you know, for a variety of reasons, just don't read them. And but now I can't help but read some of these things because now what HuffPost does is uh, instead of just allowing people to write comments in my story, 
Uh, at the end of every story, now it says, click here to contact the author. And so people are taking advantage of that. They click there. It takes them to my Huffington Post email account. And so when I go through my emails every day, I'm at least reading some of these things that people are writing to me. And, and last week, at the end of last week, I got into an email argument. No, no. I, I, I did, and, I, and I, I saved it. I didn't get rid of it. It came from this guy. I'm not, I'm not going to mention who he is, but he started it by emailing me saying, um, you know, he, he said, this bell-shaped craft was under the direction of so-and-so and so-and-so. The commanding officer was an SS general, and the fuel mix was mostly hydrogen peroxide, but the range of this craft was very limited. So by you, Lee Spiegel, by you presenting this World War II era German experiment as crashing in the USA is a joke on the readers. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, well, wait, wait a minute. That's that's not kind of how I wrote my story. And so I wrote him back <clears throat> my first response. And I said, basically, in my note to him, how far into my story did you actually get? Because if you had gone into the fifth oh, paragraph, that's funny. If you'd, if you'd even gone as far as the fifth paragraph, you would have seen where I very clearly mentioned that in 1943, this supposed bell-shaped craft fell into the hands of the United States in 1943, and we were testing it, and it was apparently being tested in 1947. Nowhere in my story did I say that we flew it over to the U.S. from Germany. I never said that. I never indicated that it had a, a, a range of flight. But you accuse me of saying that in my story. And, and Alejandro, I, I get so pissed at this stuff. <laughs> when, when, when people think that, that they know what they're talking about and they end up mostly embarrassing or trying to make me or you, the writers, look bad claiming that we don't know what we're talking about yeah. and we and we have to we either have to get on the defensive and explain to them or if we ignore them as in the case with a certain Michael Horn who of course promotes Billy Meyer Bill, his, Michael Horn's whole thing is is that if he criticizes people like you and me and if we ignore him well then that means we're agreeing with him <laughs> right that's the attitude here yeah, you, know, and you and I have been victim of the, of this kind of stuff a lot, too much, and and basically, if I can say it, it's bullshit. Yeah, well, it's funny because I got a lot of heat from this story, and I noticed I and because I did my own right, Grant, uh, um, uh, John Greenwald of the Black mm -hmm. Vault. He just posted a link to it on his Facebook and said, "What do you all think?" And they ripped him apart. At one point, he had to say, "Hey guys, don't kill the messenger here. I'm just posting the story." Exactly. And and, yeah. um, and of course, we're just uh, quoting from these other sources, so we're not saying this stuff. But I had the same situation. I had one guy who is actually a really grounded researcher. Who started coming at me? He sent me a message on Facebook, and and so this one I responded to, and I'm like, uh, well, uh, if you would have read my story, all of the things you're saying, you would have seen outlined in the last paragraph. Yeah, exactly. So he comes back a few minutes later. He said, oh, I guess I didn't read the whole thing, and uh, you know that was well written, and you're exactly right. But he's like. Uh, but you should have put something about that in the first paragraph. And it's like, no, sometimes we want people to read our stories um, and then we'll share our analysis of things. But uh, it's unfortunate that happens. And what's funny you, is you bring this up because I know you do this. And I always tell you, don't read the comments. I <laughs> have yes. been not taking my own advice. And today I was getting so frustrated because usually I don't get really upset because I don't read them. Like you do, and you get all upset. I was upset when I left today, and I said, I better stop reading the comments because I wasted so much time today when I should have been writing stories and working on the numerous other things I need to work on. Yeah. And I'm going to quit ufology altogether if I read these stories because I get or the comments because I get so frustrated. People are so mean. Yeah, and then and then so so what would happen is if guys like you and me 
decided to do that. Like, let's get out of ufology altogether. Because I've thought about it too. And then if we just kind of vanish, then what happens is these people will think, well, aha, we got them. We got them in a lie. And, and because of the shame, they can't even face us anymore. <laughs> Yeah, well, so, so, some of them are right now, you know, putting their fingers together and saying, yes, suffer. Well, it's working. I'm getting them to suffer. I, I, you know, all that I say to people, what I try to say to people as diplomatically as I can. And sometimes it's hard to be diplomatic mm-hmm. when when you're dealing with people who are looking for 15 seconds of fame. Yeah, uh, I just I just try and say to them. Um, well, for example, the, the, the story, my new story that's coming out has nothing to do with UFOs, but it's about um, the, the, the legends that go back all the way back to, to the days of the Bible, and maybe even pre-Bible of, of the theory that did giants actually live on Earth? Did they mingle with, with humans and what became of those giants and all kinds of reports and accounts, even Abraham Lincoln during one of his speeches in the 1800s, referred to a race of giants. Um, and and it's, it's so easy for people to say, well, no, that's just crap. There, there's, not, there's no evidence. Where are all the bones? And that's a good question, too. You know, it's, it's the same thing like with, with, with UFOs. People say the same thing. There, there's no evidence, and so it really can't be happening. So why are you guys dishing out all this crap to us? And I say to them, as as I'm sure I'm going to have to say in the in the next few days over my giant story, I'm going to say, <laughs> you, you know what? For all of you who think that there's nothing to this giants and UFOs, you you should take some time and do some legwork, do some research, make some phone calls. Don't just look at a documentary. Don't just read a magazine article. Pick up the phone and, and call around. Maybe call a university or two. Talk to an anthropologist. And the guys who are the stars of of this new History Channel show about giants on Earth, they are, they're two stonemason brothers from Massachusetts. And they are so righteous and right on. No bullshit. It's like their attitude is, well, we want to find out about this. We've been very curious about this. There seems to be a lot of possible evidence. We're going to go out there and we're going to hunt and we're going to find the evidence. And I say, if anybody's going to prove that they were giants, it will, it'll be these two brothers. And I even actually suggested to them the other day when they were in New York, um, I said, you guys ought to switch over to UFOs because we need more people like you. <laughs> looking into ufos because you've got <clears throat> what my father used to refer to as you've got the moxie you you have the chutzpah to go out there and do the legwork no matter where it takes you you, you know no matter where where the trail mm-hmm. of evidence where the evidence leads you you know how to do it and i admire you but you get all these people writing comments thinking they know everything there is to know simply because they're coming at it from an emotional point of view and yeah. they have they have no real clue what they're talking about but they think it's okay they they think that they they are within their rights that it's that freedom of speech rights where they can take you and me and put paint little targets on us and shoot us with their bows and arrows and and well, I, I, you know yeah when it comes to the giant thing did, 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 did these guys convince you that there could be giants Yes, absolutely. And even really, are they convinced? I uh, uh, yes, but they're still looking for the evidence. The, their show premieres tomorrow night on History Channel, mm-hmm. and and it's going to be a lot of interesting things that will be there that will lead people to believe that there's really strong evidence that there have been so many reports and accounts of people who have seen the bones, seen the skulls. Uh, and a lot of these uh, these fragments and pieces of evidence had even been sent to the Smithsonian at some point for research, mm. and the story goes that the Smithsonian um, uh, responded by saying, "Well, we don't know what you're talking about. What what bones? What what giant skeletons?" So the the questions that are raised by this kind of attitude is, is there a taboo? Uh, is there a reason why 
uh, or a conspiracy over why the public shouldn't be told that there were once giants. Mm -hmm. What could possibly be the harm of letting us know this? Uh, it, it raises some interesting questions. Uh, like, you know, for, for example, uh, wh why shouldn't we be told uh, that there might be aliens walking among us? What, what's the problem with that? You know, are people going to panic? I don't think they would, but there is this stigma or stigmata uh, attached to these kinds of things. It's like what the public doesn't know, it won't hurt them. They don't need to know they were giants. I, I mean, I was saying to these, these two brothers, Jim and Bill Vieira, I, I said, you know, every, every natural history museum in the world takes great pride in showing their dinosaur bones. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, lots of bones, individual bones, sometimes complete skeletons. They put them on display for everybody to see these great creatures that once existed on the planet. And these bones, as soon as they're dug up, they're, they're, they're processed and they're put on, to, on display. What about these giant human bones? Why isn't anybody displaying them? Where are these bones? So it's it's an interesting. Quantity. And what did they say? They say because in some places, according to some accounts, these bones have simply disintegrated. That they're not as they're not as hardy as the dinosaur bones. They're not as they they don't preserve as well. However, what what has been uncovered? I I did some research my own last week, and I found. An issue of Pravda, the um, you know the the so the former Soviet Union um, publication mm -hmm. newspaper, and there was, and I read in Pravda that a group of archaeologists had had unearthed forty burial mounds uh, in some province in uh, the Soviet Union, and in those forty burial mounds were two hundred giant human skeletons like what are you kidding me where are these skeletons why can't we see them what's the problem here well what did the pravda story say happened to him the pravda the story didn't go any further it just said that they had, hmm. they had unearthed them and there are many stories like that there are all these accounts of these things being found but then when you try to take it a step further nobody seems to have a good answer i mean if if there was a race of giants then you'd think that somebody would be interested enough to to want to uncover this. And and Bill and Jim Vieira have been talking to anthropologists who who really think that there should be a, a bigger effort to at least research this to come to to a decision on whether or not it is all phony and fictitious or is there really something to this? Mm -hmm. not, now, yeah. I was just going to say now, for example, when you're talking about what you're talking about before, I am yeah. highly, highly skeptical uh, of this this uh, story and idea. However, mm -hmm. having an open mind, I'm very excited that you wrote about it and to read your story, because I mean, that's that's how I think people should react. They should be happy. People are writing about this stuff because then you've got, a, you know, some information in one place that you could look at. Um, that takes you somewhere. And if after reading it, you think, well, there's still not enough there for me, then then so be it. But uh, to get upset uh, <laughs> that it's even done, I, I just can't conceive of that. I am certainly uh, happy you're writing this story and I'm really excited to read it. Well, you know, it's like you and I know that for decades, people have been critical about the Bigfoot hunters. Where are all the Bigfoot bones? If Bigfoot's living in the forest, how come no one's found their bones? You'd think we'd find piles of them. Well, you know, what? what why haven't we found any Loch Ness monster bones? <laughs> you know, or mm -hmm. any remains. So, so at least in this instance, there are so many reports where bones were the only thing that were found. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and yet, and yet, those bones have seem to over time vanished. Well, that's a mystery. There's nothing wrong with looking into the mystery if it at least leads you to a solid answer. Mm -hmm. these, now, getting yeah. back to the first mystery we were talking about, the Nazi yeah. story. 
Um, because there's a lot of funny stuff here, I think, and, and, you know, iffy stuff here. I mean, did that story convince you that what crashed in Roswell was this uh, Nazi bell? No, not at all. The, the, and, and what, you know, it's so funny about this, and you, you know as well as I do, in, in, in putting st- stories like this together, the thing that you and I and other writers want to do is to make the story as visual as possible. Mm. Show the show the readers what you're talking about, and and yet both you and I and the other publications that that wrote about this, we all basically used the same depiction from a Discovery Channel um, right. doc, documentary from like nineteen or six six years ago from two thousand eight, and and yet the whole the whole premise of this story is that there's a new German film um, that's talking about all this. And, and as I said at the very end of my story, I said, basically, there's one other thing about this whole new film. And I say to the readers, whoever the producers of this film are, they don't seem to be too interested in releasing any promotional clips, any trailers or still images, because I did an extensive Internet research or search and that's found nothing. Mm-hmm. If, if if this is a new German documentary, don't you want to show us a clip to tease us? But no, the only thing we could find is the Discovery Channel documentary from 2008. Yeah. So so that that that's where the pictures of the so-called Bell come from. They don't even come from the new documentary. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when when Jason and I talked about this, because sometimes. Usually we'll write our own stories, but sometimes I get afraid, you know, he's going to start to... One time this happened where we both, and he posted his first, wrote full-on stories on the same thing. Luckily, it's only happened once because we didn't coordinate. So I was asking him about this, and he's like, no, uh, I'm not going to write about that because I don't even think there is a German documentary because he had looked into it. And the only place we know of that says there's this documentary exists is a Daily Mirror. And I think I said mail before, but it was a mirror, you're right, yeah. uh, which is not the most reliable source all the time. And uh, Jason even today says, I think that they got mixed up, that maybe they showed this Discovery Channel documentary in Germany and it's not a new documentary. They're talking about the, the Discovery Channel one. I don't know, but uh, you found where the Daily Mirror, and these were things that I used too because I use them as my source. Yeah. You might have gotten some facts wrong. Oh, didn't you say that? Uh, you know, they 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 uh, one of the scientists, for instance, was working on a different project, not the one that they had said. Yeah, oh, I think I think that in your story, mm-hmm. uh, you, you you had mentioned there was like a, a German engineer named Joseph Epp. Yeah, yeah, and and um, that he, there was a quote from him. Uh, that said he had reportedly worked on the UFO project, but but I, I can't remember where I first read that, that the mistake was made that that suggested that he had worked on this Bell craft, but but it wasn't because I I did some more digging and found that he did work on or supposedly worked on a UFO project, but it was about the development of saucer shaped vehicles yeah. and, that's, and that's different from bell shaped and these saucer uh, things are like the avro things which yes. are just like kind of a, a a turbo or ducted fan kind of thing like uh like the ufo toys that they yeah, make today, yeah, yeah. or almost like a quadcopter type of thing so yeah nothing too uh exotic and and i i believe that when i was i was going through the Discovery Channel uh, documentary, because I, I ended up, this, I just I just went ahead and I embedded the entire Discovery Channel. It was like 45 minutes long. I embedded the whole documentary into my story so readers could look at it. And I had looked through most of the documentary and I found uh, at least one section where this guy, Joseph Epp, was quoted. And the quote was the quote um, that we that you and I both had, uh, had quoted in our stories, which which means this new German documentary didn't get this from him as a new quote because he was already talking about this like almost ten years ago. Mm-hmm. So so what what is as as Jerry Seinfeld would say, what is the deal with this new documentary? <laughs> yeah, and and the I guess the other point is uh, 
you know, the Daily Mirror, because the story went viral, and the Mirror was the first to write about it. Yeah. They, they were the ones who said, you know, Roswell UFO conspiracy explained in German documentary after new evidence is revealed. Um, there, and the story never makes a tie between Roswell and this thing. I mean, they say it was being tested in the U.S., but they don't say it was being tested in New Mexico. Um, they right. don't say, you know, that one went missing in that area. I mean, there's no tie-in to Roswell at all. And and you and I know, at the very least, if I'm going to believe anything that I've ever heard about Roswell, I'm going to believe the people who I interviewed who were there. I I will believe in what Jesse Marcel told me in 1978. And I believe what Robert Porter told me. Robert Porter, he's like a little known name in this whole Roswell thing. While while Jesse Marcel was posing with the alleged Roswell wreckage in an office there, and, and that photographs, those famous photographs were taken of him with this wreckage, while he was doing that, a guy named Robert Porter was one of several flight engineers. They were out on the tarmac lifting up the giant pieces of the wreckage of this thing. They were putting it onto a bomber where it was going to be flown uh, to any number of other places for analysis. And when I spoke to him, and it was Jesse Marcel who put me in touch with Robert Porter. Mm -hmm. Porter, Porter said to me, I, I was lifting up these huge pieces that looked metallic, and I was surprised because they didn't weigh anything. I didn't need any help in lifting them. They weighed like like a feather. So he was mm. he was in, he was part of the of the the group that was putting all the real stuff onto a bomber while Marcel was being photographed with presumably weather balloon stuff. Wow, that's pretty the, cool. These are the guys I prefer to believe. Right. You know, no, nothing that any of them ever said to me ever even smacked of a bell-shaped Nazi craft. I mean, come right. on. Right. Yeah. I know, you know, some UFO researchers um, think that or, or um, kind of speculate that perhaps the Kecksburg crash was one of these bell craft because uh, – it is similar in the description of what people said, acorn shaped, you know, with some weird writing around the base. Yep. So that could be. I don't know what you think about that. Can I can I tell you a little known story? I don't know if I've ever told you this. Um, of course you can. Okay. Well, get ready. No, for this. don't. <laughs> okay. In other words, it'll cost you, right? <laughs> oh, you're gonna love this. You're gonna love Ooh, this. All right. On the night that the object came flying out of the sky. I think it was first spotted over Canada and uh, went through New England and then it made whatever trajectory it made until it ended up in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Among the thousands of people who saw that object streaking through the sky were my mother and younger brother. You're kidding. I'm not. So in 1965, that was a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. My so, mother, my my mother was driving up uh -huh. a street, up a street in our hometown of Concord, New Hampshire. My younger brother Jim was in the front seat with her, and they were both startled to see this thing streaking through the sky because thousands of people saw it. Uh -huh. You know, and and this was the thing that eventually landed or crashed in Pennsylvania, and they never forgot that. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. It's pretty pretty cool. weird. So they pretty, see this yeah. thing shooting out of the sky. Which also then kind of lends a little more doubt to it being a Nazi space, you know, secret program or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because it, even if it was a Nazi thing, um, from what I understand, it probably couldn't even go that high in the sky because of the limited technology it had. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, the, the whole Nazi thing, the, the thing that, uh, the story I wrote about at the beginning of this year, um, about the the story that uh, well the the Annie Jacobs thing the Jacobs yeah. story from 2011, her whole book about Area 51 where she raised the very controversial idea about did the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin recruit 
Joseph Mengele, the doctor, the Nazi angel of death guy, did they did he Mengele surgically alter children to look like aliens in 1947? And the idea did they place these malformed children on board a Soviet spy plane to become the Roswell UFO crash just to scare Americans? And that that was a big part of her book and. And the uh, the people who really worked at Area 51 were very upset with her that she had included that in her book. Mm-hmm. And and then I don't know. Do you remember at the beginning of this year that the whole story that came out about how uh, Edward Snowden, the uh, oh the, yeah, the whistleblower, uh, that there was a story that suggested that the the U.S. government um, was and is under the control of a shadow government that's overseen by aliens who helped Nazi Germany's rise in the yeah. 1930s. And I, I, I remember thinking at the time, well, if extraterrestrials were helping Nazi Germany, why did they lose the war? Yeah, those are some <laughs> lame aliens. Those are sorry aliens. <laughs> so, so yeah, this, this whole alleged Nazi ufo connection it keeps kind of cropping up like that that bad penny that just keeps showing up yeah. and it, it's like what what is the point what is going on here yeah. uh you know so, I, I, like like stan friedman is always saying you know follow the evidence to where it leads well i don't think there's any really substantial or credible evidence that that involves the nazis or germany or bell-shaped ufo i don't buy it at all yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I agree with you. Uh, whether you read it in German or your English version, I think uh, <laughs> doubt is cast. Now, you have not only has this story been controversial, and it's funny because you get it from both sides. You you know, uh, I'm sure you do, and I do too. Is you get people saying, "Oh, you know, you're not giving the story." Uh, justice and then you have more of the other side or i think people on the ufo side are just so fed up with the suggestion of the the roswell thing being nazi you get it from both sides uh so that one was really controversial but you have another controversial one that you did a couple weeks too Uh on this video of what appears to be an object passing in front of the moon uh, I think the person who took this video with his telescope feels that it's possibly, you know, uh, maybe around orbit or very close to the surface of the moon. Yeah. Uh, his name, his his on-screen name, his YouTube name is is Crow with two R's, Kuro seven seven seven, or he goes by the name of Crow Triplehorn. He's he's like an, an amateur astronomer looks through his uh, telescope. He shoots high-definition video through an 8-inch telescope. And he has supposedly captured a lot of interesting videos, uh, high-res videos, that he's he's put on the web. Um, And to, to email him, we never actually spoke, but to email back and forth and to hear his video analysis, his analysis videos of these things, he, he sounds like he's very intelligent that he's actually given given a lot of thought to these things he doesn't come off like a mm-hmm. wild like a wild guy um he pledges on his youtube page that he's never going to run any deceptive or misleading clips on his channel and some of his things look interesting but are and i don't even believe that he's come out and said that he thinks that these are are aliens all that he's really said is I didn't fake this at all. It's something. It's interesting. I'm putting it out to you. And this one was funny, too, because I saw the video. I thought it was interesting, and I couldn't explain what it was. Yeah. I emailed Ben and Mark. Yeah. And then Ben responded, you know, Ben Hansen, uh, who worked for Fact or Faked and and has a, you know, a, a... uh, law enforcement background with the FBI and stuff and uh, mm-hmm. fact and fake of course they were looking to explain things and Mark D'Antonio who's MUFON's photo analyst I emailed them and Ben responded and said well I actually just gave an analysis to Lee but uh, <laughs> do you want it too and I wasn't <laughs> sure if I was going to write about it because I was so on the fence with this one but I wanted to hear their thoughts and uh, I, I was saying, thinking well if they give me something substantial enough or 
often, you know, these guys will give an explanation and then you're like, oh, yeah, there you go. I should have seen that. But uh, I decided to to wait for your story. And uh, and uh, yeah, what happened? What, what what happened on this story, Alejandro, had never happened to me before on any other story I've written. Mm. So so that caught my attention. The first thing after my story was up, uh, I about a day after it had been posted, I got an email from Crow Triplehorn. The well, man what did Bennett and Mark tell you though? Well, in, ter- in terms of what they what they saw, uh, I think first of all, Ben Hansen said that he didn't see anything in the videos that would indicate to him that that this was computer generated. So basically, he was saying the guy didn't just phony it up using Photoshop. Mm-hmm. But he also s- said that the video also didn't have anything that would have Ben believe that the object was anything other than a conventional satellite. And 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 he went on to to explain why about how the the sun reflects off the moon and backlights the object, and so we would expect it to look silhouetted against the moon, which it does. Um, and and he he referred to things called pixel bleed or color bleed, that he says is is very common um, when a video goes through a compression in the editing process. And and then you know he, this was this was his point of view, and then Mark D'Antonio uh, agreed with Ben's description of this pixel bleed. Uh, ben uh, no, Mark referred to it as compression artifacting. I love the words that these guys throw around. Yeah. So uh, one question I had because uh, I I saw their analysis, and one thing that I thought Crow did very well is yeah. in order the reason his logic is that. It wasn't something like that is because he drew a line in his right. video and yeah. this thing seems to arc a little bit. And uh, so how did Mark and, and Ben explain that? What what he did, what Crow did was he, in, in one image, uh, like you said, he drew like a, a very straight line that would seem to um, follow the plane of where the object was moving. And if it was a conventional satellite, then it would have stayed completely straight as part of its orbit. But Triplehorn believed that in a couple of places, as you're watching the object, it seems to veer off from its straight course and then come back. And he, he felt that that meant that it was something different from a satellite. But but uh, Ben Hansen said to me that he, he didn't think that Triplehorn made the case that it was mm-hmm. changing changing direction. He was Ben went on to explain that when, when the Earth moves away from orbiting objects, it might look like they're on a different path, but they're not. And that there's atmospheric distortion, what he calls atmospheric distortion, so that it might make an object appear to not be going straight, even though it might be going in a straight line. And and Mark said the same thing. He said this was pretty much uh, just a satellite, that the wavering of the object um, Meant, felt that he said there could be something that was slowly tumbling, uh, that it wasn't just moving uh, in in a way that could be like under intelligent control. An object that's tumbling, like an old rocket booster, he said, might make the the path of it appear to waver just a little bit, um, even though it was still traveling in a straight line. Hmm. So he so he said he's leaning toward. This being another ordinary satellite, so so all of this went into my story, and about a day later, I got an email, my first email from Crow Triplehorn, thanking me for writing the story, for um, for putting his quotes up there and for putting his videos up there, but but he, his attitude was, I really wish someone had called me first and asked me uh, some of these questions so that I could could have you know gone into a little more further about why I think that my analysis about it not being a satellite was correct. So he said, so in, with that in mind, I've created a new video and my new video is basically titled my response to the Huffington Post. <laughs> uh-huh. So, so what he did was he made a whole like 20 minute video and pretty much took my story word for word for word and took it apart to try and give his more enlightened point of view that he thought 
uh, that he thought that it needed its due uh, respect. And but even before he sent me that video, he posted it on Facebook so the world could see it first. And then he sent it to me and he asked me very politely if I would consider either doing another story or to somehow update my story and include his video response uh, to my Huffington Post story. Well, before I did anything, before I acted on this at all, the floodgates opened and I have never received so much email from people who basically were demanding that I post Triple Horn's new video. And these people, each of these people had apparently seen it on Facebook because each of them sent me the link to this new, you know, HuffPost uh, analysis video. And they're all saying things like, you know, dear Mr. Spiegel, um, you know, in uh, beca because of uh, what you supposedly represent as journalistic integrity, we, we you know, respectfully urge you to post Mr. Triple Horn's new video, blah, 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 and let him get his say. And Alejandro, if only a couple of people had said that to me, I might not have done anything, but they kept pouring in. Wow. Yeah. And I, so I called my editor, um, Buck Wolf, and this was over the weekend when the story was, was published. And I said to him, I said, look, Buck, I, I really would like to post this guy's new video at the bottom of my story because it, the response is getting too out of hand. And I, I think it's okay that we post his response. I've looked at it. I've, I've seen it. It's, it's, it's fine. He does a good job of defending himself. And I'd like to do it. So Buck said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And so I added an update to my original story. And I just basically said that after this article was first published, Crow Triplehorn sent a new video to the Huffington Post offering his response to our story. Here's his response. And I linked that right to his new video. Um, and then things sort of <laughs> quieted down after that. Oh, and I, and I actually got another video, uh, another um, email from Mr. Triplehorn thanking me for that and telling me that if I, if I ever need his help with any kind of further UFO video analysis, please call on him. Mm -hmm. So, so it turned out okay. Um, and, and I, I wanted people to know that, that at the very least I'm being fair about this stuff. And not that you weren't fair to begin with because you include his original analysis. It's just yeah. you're doing what a journalist does and getting expert opinion. Yeah, well, you know, that, that that's what I'm trying to do. And I, I l let me even tell you one more aftermath of all mm -hmm. of this. And, and I, I didn't even see this coming. Um, after I had posted the update, I started getting videos. Uh, I started getting... Uh, more emails from people saying, well, Mr. Spiegel, uh, that was the nice thing that you do to post Triple Horn's response. Now we'd like to ask you to do something else. No, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Now we think that it would be a really good idea um, if, if you were to open the door to a debate about all of this so that so that the crow triple horn can actually debate mark d'antonio and ben hansen and and you and you can be involved with this and and i responded to a couple of them and i basically said i do not get involved with any debates especially yeah. especially ufo debates because in my opinion after looking at this stuff for over 40 years now and i've seen a lot of debates in 40 years, nothing really comes from them, from them except tension, bad feelings, no definitive answers. They linger, they go nowhere. It's petty, it's childish. And I personally will never debate anyone because I, I do not want to be backed into a corner and have people accuse me of putting facts out there that I can't back up because I don't do that. All I do, which is what you do, Alejandro, is we present information and let the readers decide 
how they feel about it, if they're going to believe it, or if they want to go out and do their own legwork and decide for themselves. That's our yeah. job. That's what we do. Well, and debate, you know, uh, this whole thing with debate seems to be kind of just a really uh, a soapbox kind of thing because it, it's true of politics. You know, you work for Huffington Post, uh, yeah, mostly yeah. a political paper. And, you know, they always talk about it, during this time of year, are debates really needed and useful? Because often uh, they just walk away, people walk away with the same opinions, and there's no instant fact checking that can usually go on there's some with a moderator but it's not like a moderator can go check all facts at the time so during a debate you know in fact there was a story today about how bill nye uh debated the creationists you know uh that creationist uh, a few months ago i remember i was watching that yes yeah and how it really didn't you know everybody thought bill nye will annihilate him but uh, just today, there were some other groups saying that they 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 um, turned down the request to do a similar debate because the people on the you know of the side of the the uh, the creationists can just throw out non factual information that isn't verified or or is not you know scientifically accurate, and it's not like there's anybody fact checking. So what can you do? And then the creationists who already have an idea. Uh, walk away with, oh, okay, we won because, you know, the guy couldn't uh, instantly dispute our facts. And even if you do say that's not true, well, you know, people who want to believe it are going to believe it. So what can you do? I mean, it, it's just uh, kind of just grandstanding sort of thing often. It's totally grandstanding. And and as you and I discussed before, there there are, there's always some kind of an email debate thread that's going on among some of the yeah. ufo proponents uh and it's just it's just exhausting to read this it stuff. is it, it's like come on folks don't we have better things to think about to talk about to to look into i mean forget the debates they're gonna go nowhere they're gonna solve nothing let's come up with some good evidence and just keep move forward but this yeah. debate and I, you're right i hate that the whole every time that there's a political debate nobody comes out a winner nobody yeah, yeah. because they all end up backstabbing each other and what's the, <laughs> yeah what's the point of that you know we the audience we get to see these people slamming each other and so what's the point it, it makes us hate them all yeah well and it's funny because because of debates you know um, the Clintons and Obama didn't like each other for a long period of time after he won because the debates right. were so heated. Yep. Same thing happened with Reagan and the Bushes. Uh, they were completely at odds for the longest time uh, because of those debates, and they got so so heated. So you're right, the hard feelings. Um, on a final note, because I know we're we're about out of time, and you got to run. But uh, going all the way back to the beginning and the first story we talked about. One thing I wanted to mention that I thought was really cool, and I think you'll appreciate this too. One yeah. really neat thing that the Daily Mirror did do is they put up a poll on their story. And the poll asked people, what do you think was behind the Roswell incident? A Nazi war machine, weather balloons, definitely aliens or not a clue. Um, to be honest, I always put not a clue. However, only 30% put that. 28% say a Nazi war machine, so it's interesting that the story convinces so many people. Of course, this isn't a scientific poll. It could be people going in there and pushing that a lot. The most uh, response was definitely aliens at 36%. But this is what I find really interesting, that the official government answer of a weather balloon is at 7%. Yeah, very low. Yeah, And I think that even though this isn't a scientific poll, um, typically, you know, uh, a sample size of 30 people or more is, is fairly representative of a population. I, it seems that, and I've been watching this poll, and it's been similar the entire time, the government really hasn't convinced many people. Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe the reason for that is because the most recent 
government official explanation for Roswell, and I forget what year they did this, was was when they admitted, and I put that word in quotes, and they admitted that it was something called Project Mogul, mm -hmm. which, which was a high altitude device that was set to record any Soviet nuclear testing. Um, and so by the time that they were saying that, it sounded really good, and it, it just kind of put the whole weather balloon explanation to rest. And maybe that's why maybe the, the, that six or seven percent now think that that's probably what it was because it was because it was it was displaced or you know by the uh, Project Mogul explanation. Well, and that's a good point. And if they would have put government balloon here, would it have really changed the number? Uh, and I think that would they probably should have worded it different because. Uh, differently, because I would have been really interested to see uh, if they did put government balloon, what percentage would go there? Uh, because it, it this indicates, though, the possibility, and, and I'll see what you think, that, you know, it, the other answers were pretty similar in uh, the percentages they got. But the official government answer is the lowest. And it seems that perhaps the population mainstream regular joes out there aren't really buying the government story i think that if, if they had in, in the wording of this poll if they had worded that instead of saying just weather balloon six percent if they had said um u.s government high altitude soviet spying device i think that would have gotten a bigger number yeah because Maybe that, that, that would admit that would have seemed more plausible. Although people would have had to been educated to that, and as you and I know, because we write about these polls uh, often, that the wording is so very important. The verbiage is really important, and usually when it comes to UFO polls, they get it wrong. Um, but there was a recent UFO, or not so recent, but what a few months ago now, where the Huffington Post and YouGov did a really good job with that. We did it. We did it. Was at the I think it was at the end of um, of 2003. We did a, a YouGov HuffPost uh, poll on a variety of things related to um, extraterrestrials. How many of you think that the extraterrestrials might actually exist? Uh, that uh, some UFOs could turn out to be extraterrestrial vehicles. Um, that the government is covering up information. And I believe that the the average uh, number was was not far from 50 percent. Of American adults believed that that not only does is something being kept from us, but but that the the government knows more than it's saying. Mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of people believe that because history has shown us that the government has many times um, you know, eventually fessed up about something that originally weren't weren't too keen on letting the public know about. Right. And so and so why not apply the same information to UFOs? I, I will say this, and my attitudes have been changing a little bit about UFOs and how the government has been handling it as far as the public is concerned. And and I, I, I'm at a point now where I believe that, it, that it's not so much that it's been a cover-up or a conspiracy – but those words are so easy to throw around. People love to throw those around. I, I would much prefer to think that it's not just the United States. And these are this is also based on conversations I've had with our friend Nick Pope mm -hmm. about, about how the British government did the same kind of things that he saw while he was working in the UFO office in the 1990s. Um, a, a thing that he that he referred to as spin and dirty tricks that, that he and I were talking about during an interview that I did with him. He said that when he was working at the Ministry of Defense uh, and reading through UFO reports and trying to come up with explanations, they, they developed a policy called spin and dirty tricks. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, we were told, I was told that we were to explain away as many UFO sightings and reports as we could, and sometimes to the point of ridiculing people. And I said, well, why would you do that? Why would any government do that? He said, because the powers that be uh, in Parliament in the UK didn't know how to tell the public, that they, uh, didn't know how to admit to the public 
that there were things that were being reported that were flying around operating in our skies that we didn't know everything about. We couldn't control them. We couldn't catch them. We couldn't do anything about it. And and so we had to, we were told to downplay it just to try and make it go away simply because we didn't know. And mm -hmm. I'm 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 more apt to believe that now. Uh, I don't think that the governments of the world actually really know everything that's going on with really unusual, unexplained uh, flying objects. I, th I think this is a much bigger deal than most people can imagine, and we might just not know all the facts yet. Mm -hmm. I got. I'm. I'm there with you. I think that uh, that's closer to what's going on. Who? But it's. I don't know if it's like you. My opinions do change fairly regularly. It's yeah. just so hard to know. But but it's because of the fact that you and I believe this stuff and we we agree on this. It's because. And even 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 our our friends, Jacques Vallée, you know, and and to an extent, former Colonel now Dr. John Alexander, these are people who are no nonsense, I would say, <clears throat> experts in things like UFOs, and and they both continue to talk about how we really aren't asking the right questions we don't mm -hmm. we don't know exactly it, yeah and instance? i think it's important to note that both of these people are not skeptics or debunkers as many people think they are very much paranormal enthusiasts yes absolutely absolutely um I mean, people don't even know that John Alexander, who, who the UFO community has put down a lot, um, and I think very unfairly uh, because of things he's written about UFOs, they, they think he's he's out there giving disinformation for the government. I don't think that at all. I mean, people are, are amazed when I tell them that when when that at one point in his career, after he left the military, John Alexander was the president of the International Society of Near-Death Experiences, or the, the International Institute of, in other words, of scientists who study the near-death experiences. Like, wow, that's amazing. John has, John and his wife travel around the world and they collect images and videotapes of actual magical ceremonies that are conducted by real shamans in, in deep in the Amazon jungle. And John is one of the few people invited to see these things and to videotape them. And, and it's like really amazing stuff. But the UFO people don't know that he's involved in this stuff. They just think he's giving out this information. I say, no, that's not what's happening. Right. Yeah. I agree. We've both spent a lot of time with him, and he's uh, very, very interested in this stuff. And he will defend the uh, the reality of this phenomenon, you know, um, just as voraciously as he'll defend his other views. Ab absolutely. You know, I mean, really, on the day that Robert Bigelow, the aerospace raconteur, the man who's working with NASA now to build outer space modules to go to the uh, International Space Station. Robert Bigelow, on the day that he signed the lease to own a little place in Utah called the Skinwalker Ranch, where lots and lots of paranormal phenomena were, were going on, um, when he signed the lease to begin scientific investigation of that place, who was standing there with him, next to him when he signed the lease, and who spent the first night alone at the Skinwalker Ranch was Dr. John Alexander. Right. You know, so this guy, you know, he's he's getting he's he's been getting an unfair treatment from the UFO community if they would only open their minds and and take a look at what he's done and what he's doing. Right. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show uh, oh, yeah. and spending all this time. I know you're you're so busy. You're doing uh, Alan Palmer's radio show in Las Vegas uh, quite regularly and others. Mm -hmm. And 
I know you have another big story to write, your giant story. We're working on – it's a big giant story. I'm, I'm trying to weave in somehow to mention the Jolly Green Giant or Ho, Ho, Ho <laughs> <laughs> into the story somehow. Um, but, yeah, we're working on that, and I, I still have some other things coming up, as you do. I can't wait to see what I'm going to be stealing from you in the future. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be heading out to see Travis Walton um, in just a couple of days and, and hopefully – Film him get taken again. You're, were you, are you going right back, <laughs> to, right back to the actual abduction scene? Yes, we are. So that should be exciting. Very cool. And our well, good buddy Ben and others, uh, other of our good friends, will be out there as well. So, yeah, I, I haven't, I, I don't have a chance to get out there myself, but um, hopefully we'll get a chance to see each other before next year's International UFO Congress. Mm -hmm. Now with Bob Lazar, did you see that? Yes, and I, I think that that's very cool. And I was even talking to Alan Palmer of the National Atomic Testing Museum in Vegas. And it, we what we would love to do, I, I know that, that Mr. Lazar is not doing a presentation per se, that he's there and will be there with George Knapp. Um, but but certainly it would be great if, if I could work it out. And if he okays it, if I could sit down with both George Knapp and Bob and do a, a double interview with them so so that Lazar doesn't feel like I'm just trying to get information from him. I, I think the two of them working in you know in Congress with each other is is really important. Well work with George and good luck with that because it was a lot of work and very difficult to make this happen and he yeah. uh, has expressed many times how reticent he is to speak with people in this community. So um yeah, good luck. I am just happy we've got it worked out, and so now we're getting to crunch time. But hopefully, you can can pull that off because I know you'd have some some great questions. But it's going to be a good time. And uh, if you have some questions we want you want us to ask, and be sure to let us know. I will. I will. Thank you for having me on again today. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Check out Lee Spiegel on the Huffington Post, and thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Don't forget you can go to the Huffington Post Weird News and you'll see his stories. He mostly writes about UFOs, but as he said, he's going to be writing about giants. Sometimes he writes about Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and all of this other stuff. So you can see all of his uh, writings at uh, Huffington Post. You can also put in the search his name and it's S P E I. G-E-L, and you'll be able to see all of his stories. He's got a real, lot of really good stuff there. He does a lot of really good research. That's one thing. His stories may take a little longer to come out, but that's because he's interviewing people and he's doing a lot of research and getting some new information on his stories before he gets those out. So thanks again uh, for being on the show, Lee. Don't forget to check out Spacing Out. We do have one Friday. It's a bit of a shorter version. And unfortunately, we don't have a Jason piece on this next, on this one uh, coming out Friday. But uh, that's because we got it out quickly so we could go see Travis Walton. So we're going to be going to his Skyfire Summit uh, this week and this weekend. It starts really the pre-conference stuff starts on Wednesday the 5th tomorrow because that's the anniversary of the event, the 39th anniversary. So he's taking people out to the UFO site and doing some sky watching and telling people about it the next day some witnesses are coming and doing a press conference so we're going to film all that so you can check it out on our YouTube and if you want to join us there for the weekend you can still go register at sky uh, go to the just google skyfire summit and you'll find it and uh, join some of the speakers out there he's going to have a lot of speakers he's got like you know, Stanton Friedman, uh, Richard Dolan, um, Chris O'Brien. He's got the Native American uh, that we had, the Navajo Rangers out there to talk. Uh, Clifford Mahuti, who's going to be at the UFO Congress to talk about uh, Native American tales and, and aliens and stuff. So a lot of really cool people, and it's mostly going to be centered around his event and uh, research around, you know, his, uh, the UFOs coming in and taking him, so stuff like that. So very cool. Uh, hopefully you can join us this weekend. If you can, come say hi. Also, of course, register for the UFO Congress ASAP now that we have Bob Lazar signed up. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Bob Lazar, but he's essentially the guy who put Area 51 on the map because he came out in um, – 
in the in the 80s uh, saying that he worked at Area 51 at the secret place called S4 and that he worked on back engineering alien technology. He told this to George Knapp, a journalist in Las Vegas, and uh, both of them and their research kind of made Area 51 now a household name. People didn't even believe it existed, funny enough, because they're like, oh, UFO people talk about it. But hey, us UFO people talk about some legitimate stuff, peeps, and uh, Area 51's existence was one of them. So now finally CIA has admitted that. Uh, so Bob Lazar has been very secretive. He doesn't talk often, but we're going to have George Knopp talk for an hour about uh, Bob Lazar and uh, some compelling evidence that uh, what he's saying is not all bunk. And then Bob Lazar is going to come out and do a Q&A. So if you want to submit questions for us to ask Bob Lazar, you know, feel free to either email those to contact or uh, get a hold of us and let us know what your questions are, and we'll try to ask. And more, uh, even better, come to the UFO Congress February 18th to the 22nd and see him and many other awesome speakers. It's the biggest event. We won the Guinness World Records for the largest UFO conference. So this year will probably be even bigger now that people will be able to see Bob Lazar. And of course, everyone's very excited including us also uh we're gonna have more youtube videos out you know we went and watched the mufon guys and uh, their boot camp training that they have so we're gonna have a video out on that so we've got a lot going on on our youtube including spacing out so check that out so thank you all very much for listening thank you to caleb hanks for the opening and close music you can get his